Old powers waken, shadows stir, an age of wonder and terror will soon be upon us, an age for gods and heroes. The glass candles are burning, and you're listening to the Obsidian Nights Podcast. Hello, my sweet summer children. In today's episode of the Obsidian Nights podcast, I will be doing brand four. And with me today, I have a special guest, Moadib from Arrakis. Hello. <laughs> it is me. It is me, the Quizza Tatarak himself. Hey, guys. Long time no see. I'm so excited. I can't believe we're finally back doing Obsidian Nights. Yes. Uh, so... It's Quinn from Quinn's hey Ideas, and yeah. we, uh, my the moon of my life, <laughs> my, <laughs> my sun my, and stars. Yes, we're <laughs> back, and we're gonna be doing brand four, and there's so much juice with brand four. Um, Tyrion comes to Winterfell, but mainly we get introduced to Old Nan's stories. And that is definitely the most intriguing part of this chapter, I would say, because there's so much that we learn here. We learn a little bit about old Nan and who she is, what is her position amongst House Stark, um, how long she's been in, in, around House Stark. We learn that she was like, she was around when Ned was a kid and that her only living fam- family member is Hodor. And then she also gives us some really good bits of information about the White Walkers and some of those legends and some cool bits about stories as well, like in the way that she says that these aren't my stories, these stories were before me and they'll be here after me. So yes. yeah. Yes, and so when the chapter opens up, we have Bran and he's recovered a little bit from his fall, he's paralyzed. And he's like looking down from the window, like looking at Rickon running and Shaggy Dog running across the yard and he wants to be there with them. And he's, he's only eight, mm-hmm. but he's all like, I'm grown now. Like, I'm a man grown now. I'm too old to cry. Like, he wants to cry, but he can't. And yeah. so basically, old man um, comes in and tells him, you know, um, Bran wants to cry. And he says, it was just the lie, he said bitterly, remembering the crow from his dream. I can't fly. I can't even run. And old man tells Bran that all crows are liars. All crows are liars. So that has been a thing that has popped up in a couple theories throughout the Mm -hmm. fandom, like all crows being liars. What, like, what does she mean by that? It's, it's really, really interesting. I, I, I think I can only help, but suspect that it's George R. R. Martin foreshadowing something with blood raven now i know other people have different opinions about blood raven you know his malevolence or benevolence i've always tended to side on the side that blood raven while maybe he does feel like he's doing everything he's doing for the greater good i feel like there is a degree of manipulation going on involving blood raven and brain aka the three-eyed crow so oh, certainly <laughs> of there's definitely manipulation there, but I do agree that I feel like Blood Raven feels like he has to do whatever he has to do to save the mm-hmm. world, and he does manipulate Bran. I never understood why Bran just goes along with everything. Like I, never t- I think I know. Questions. I know why. I totally understand why. Because you know how like Sir Lewin says to Bran, you know, like I studied magic too. He's like, every boy dreams of like having hidden secret powers. Mm -hmm. And so of course, when the wizard calls to you from the sky and says, come, come seek the, like, it's like with Daenerys, like we'll teach you the language of dragon kind, come with us. Like, Uh so Bran, Bran being so young and crippled and feeling like he has no other way, no other option. He's like, maybe there is a way that I can fly. Maybe if I go seek out this wizard, then, you know, I can become a wizard myself. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I just don't know. Like, I think if I, I don't know, I'm 
because not, he's, I'm not eight. <laughs> yeah. So I wouldn't necessarily eat that weirwood paste once I got in the cave. I'd have a little more questions. Yeah. Like, what is this paste? <laughs> Look, the cage is a different story. At that point, like after you've seen some shit, like I would have been like, wait a second. Got but some like, questions. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few questions. But yeah, I get the appeal of like being like super, super young and then being like, wait, I can do magic and you can teach me to do magic. Exactly. And it had to be like even more appealing than brain. Cause he yeah, because he couldn't walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So we get our, we've heard about Old Nan in other mm -hmm. chapters, but we get our first official look at Old Nan. And Bran's like, he's mad, but she's like, when he says this, he's mad. He's like, she's a very ugly old woman. <laughs> Shrunken and wrinkled and almost blind. Too weak to climb stairs with only a few wisps of white hair left to cover her modded <laughs> pink skin scalp so like okay, he, he read her, yeah he read her ass <laughs> he really but, did like but he you was, didn't have to say all that brand yes because you're a little upset but what you were talking about was um the stories not being her stories she mm. says like the stories are before me and after me before you too and that they're not her story so these are stories that have been passed down through generations after generation after generation absolutely is it especially when it comes to the white walker story but i think it's cool but before we even get to that it's like the funny thing about this whole scene is old nan is trolling the heck out of brand <laughs> yes pushing all the buttons I knew a story about a boy who hated stories <laughs> <laughs> she was like if old nan had a twitter account could you imagine Oh my God. Oh, my <laughs> sweet summer children. Yes. Y'all don't know shit. <laughs> oh, I could hear her now. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Well, before we get into the White Walkers, because we're definitely about to get into that, um, we don't know exactly where Old Nan came from mm -hmm. or who she is, where she originated from. Um, we know that she came to Winterfell to be a wet nurse for a Brandon Stark, but mm -hmm. there are so many so Brandon, many <laughs> that we don't know which Brandon Stark or which time she actually came. Um, but she is related. Is she related to Hodor? She's related to Hodor in some way that we don't necessarily understand. We haven't been given the direct relation, I do not believe, but she is related to Hodor, um, which I think, you know, we know that scene from the show, the hold the door scene. Everybody knows about that. So apparently that was George R. R. Martin's idea in some way. So I yes. think that when, when we see that like flashback and we see old Nan there with Hodor in the show, that's accurate. I think she was there probably when that happened to Hodor. That's why like right in this first chapter that we see her, we get a mention of Hodor as well because these two characters are like connected. So yeah. that was one of the things that the show did kind of right, but then not really because where the heck did that door come from? Like what it makes sense, whatever. <laughs> door in the cave cave yeah. door <laughs> it would have made more sense if it was like a door in the wall or something like that but yeah like, or if it was like a stone that rolled away or something i don't know yeah whatever. it yeah. was weird yeah <laughs> so the the first um story that they talk about is brand the builder so old nan's like i can tell you a story about brandon the builder that was always mm -hmm. your favorite um brandon the builder being brand's favorite story mm -hmm. i find as kind of foreshadowing because brand 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 why do i keep like not being able to say these fucking names because <laughs> brandon the builder had he built winterfell and i mm -hmm. i kind of think he was the last hero but that's just like a theory of mine mm -hmm. um so i could kind of see like some correlation where brand might go down like a similar path yeah, because it's like Bran, even if he doesn't like directly build something, he could like take on the position of like chest master and kind of like rebuild society after the destruction of the White Walkers. Because like, again, going back to the show, King Bran, that's a George R. R. Martin idea. So mm -hmm. Bran the Builder, he's restructuring society, rebuilding it from the ground up maybe. But then also for a little bit of crack pottery, you know, all those theories that are like Bran is a time traveler and Bran actually is Bran the Builder. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but George R. R. Martin, if you don't want people to think that, stop leaving all these clues that that's actually true. Yes. Because there's so the many hints end, that it's... 
the storm's <laughs> end thing, right? <laughs> yeah. There's there, there's so many examples that it's like, what is Bran a time traveler? Did he? And then to top it off, the fact that we know that Bran actually can time travel. You know what I'm saying? I don't right. think that theory is trash. Because like even in the show, I'm not in the show, even in the book, right? If you remember in A Dance with Dragons, when Bran takes the paste, the werewood paste, mm -hmm. he sees Ned Stark and he calls out to Ned Stark and Ned Stark hears him. Yes. And then when he gets pulled back, everyone's like super interested in what Bran heard. They're like, what did you see? What did you hear? And Blood Raven, make, they all make sure to tell Bran, no, no, no. You, couldn't, you can't change anything. You can't yes. change anything. And it's not until later that Bran suddenly falls asleep later that night, not even like remembering falling asleep because Blood Raven made him fall asleep, I think, that he mm -hmm. sees the dream when he can't talk to his dad because that's what Blood Raven wanted to show him. Blood, it's manipulation. That's yeah. the way I see it. I see it's definitely manipulation. And I do definitely agree that Ned heard him mm -hmm. and that they didn't want him to think that Ned heard him. Mm -hmm. And I also think that, I mean, this isn't canon, but just throwing this out there. So they released the history and lore, um, like back of the DVD, like when you get the Blu-ray on the back of the DVD, Game of Thrones puts out history and lore. Mm -hmm. so there was one with Bran the Builder in it, and he was in like a wheelchair. See, that's... <laughs> he was like being carried. That makes me think. I mean, that seems like a pretty big hint right there. And I was so, like, like, why is he being carried? <laughs> yeah. See, like, like to dismiss the time traveling brand thing as complete crack pottery, I think, is wrong. I don't know, George R. Martin, if he, would, if he did something like that, obviously, he's going to imply a certain degree of subtlety. It's not going to be like back to the future time travel stuff, but like... I can certainly see some timey-wimey messed up stuff going on because mm -hmm. that's what happened in the show with Hodor. And then, too, we've seen brand new time travel stuff already. All this stuff with looking into the past and stuff. This is Yeah, and, like, as he looks into the past, the tree actually shrinking with him. Mm -hmm. And he can taste the blood. And then what, what we're getting on a tangent a little bit, but, like, <laughs> even what Blood Raven says about time being a river. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the tree, a werewood is not like a man. A tree is in one place and it can move between time. Yeah. So like we, yeah. So it's like um, the it's Blood Raven describes it. And this has always kind of like freaked me out as he calls it the flutter of a moth swing. Mm -hmm. Like and then the undying ones say the same or the Piat priest is the same thing about the undying ones. Like they our time passes to them as in the flutter of a moth swing and i'm like okay hold up there's some kind of connection between that because that is the exact same fucking quote frozen in time you know i don't know just yeah very slow aging Interesting. yes so brand says like i know that story about brand the builder like he built all these castles and storms end and all this stuff but that's not my favorite story mm -hmm. my favorite story are the scary ones Yes. So, um, he's, oh, my sweet summer uh, child. <laughs> what do you know of fear? Fear is for the winter, my little lord, when the snow falls a hundred feet deep and the ice wind comes howling out of the north. Fear is for the long night, when the sun hides its face for years at a time and little children are born and live and die all in darkness, while the dire wolves grow gaunt and hungry and the white walkers, white walkers move, move through, through the woods. <laughs> you, mean, <laughs> you mean the others? Bran said. The others, old Nan agreed. Thousands and thousands of years ago, a winter fell that was cold and hard and endless beyond all memory of man. There came a night that lasted a generation and kings shivered and died in their castle. Even the even as the swineherds in their hovels, women smothered their children rather than see them starve and cried and felt their tears freeze on their cheeks. Her voice in her needles fell silent, and she glanced up at Bran with pale, filmy eyes and asked, So, child, this is the sort of story that you like? In that darkness, the others came for the first time, she said as her needles went click, click, click. They were cold things, dead things, that hated iron and fire and the touch of the sun, and every creature with hot blood in its veins. They swept over holdfast in cities and kingdoms, 
felled heroes and armies by the score, riding their, riding their pale dead horses and leading host of the slain. All the swords of men could not stay their advance, and even maidens and suckling babes found no pity in them. They hunted the maids through frozen forest and fed their dead servants on the flesh of human children. Her voice dropped very low, almost to a whisper, and Bran found himself leaning forward to listen. Now these were the days before the Andals came, and long before the women fled across the narrow sea from the cities of the Rhoyne, and the hundred kingdoms of those times were the kingdoms of the first men, who had taken these lands from the children of the forest. Yet here and there, in the fastness of the woods, the children still lived in their wooden cities and hollow hills, and the faces in the trees kept watch. So a cold and death filled the earth. The last hero determined to seek out the children in the hopes that their ancient magics could win back what the armies of men had lost. He set out into the dead lands with a sword, a horse, a dog, and a dozen companions. For years he searched until he despaired of ever finding the children of the forest in their secret cities. One by one his friends died, and his horse, and finally even his dog. And his sword froze so hard that the blade snapped when he tried to use it. And the others smelt the hot blood in him, and came silent on his trail, stalking him with packs of pale white spiders, big as hounds. <laughs> and then we're interrupted by the knock on the door. Yeah. Muadib. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no. So that's a lot to unpack. Oh, okay. Let's 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 talk about the aesthetic of the scene though. You got Bran, right? In this room with this old lady. And she's got like, they didn't do this in the show because she's like basically blind in the book. So she's got like these milky, pale white eyes. And she's yes. telling this, she's looking up at him, telling this creepy story. She knows exactly what she's doing. She's like, this little boy think he knows what's up. Let me scare the fuck out of him real quick. <laughs> Facts, though. Yeah. She's like, I've seen shit. Like, you just calm down. Like, you don't know what's scary. My sweet summer child. <laughs> yeah. And it, and it is, like, at, when she drops her voice to a whisper, and mm-hmm. he has to, like, lean in to hear her. I was uh, expecting her to go, boo. <laughs> but the knock on the door did that. Like, the yeah. knock on the door totally interrupted everything this quote what interests you the most oh my god so i think the bits about the children of the forest helping and the last heroes because i've always found the story weird like the structure of the story doesn't make sense when we think about the actual history and the way things went down Mm -hmm. right the children of the forest hiding off and not helping until the last minute is very suspicious And it should have always struck us as suspicious, like reading this initially. I don't think my first time reading the book, it did, but it does now. Because it says, this went on for a generation of darkness, right? And then we meet the children of the forest who must have been suffering too, right? This is cold and dark and death. They don't live like that. They're beings of nature. The natural cycle is important to them too. So why weren't they fighting up until the hour was very, very late? Why didn't they fight until a human sought them out? Mm -hmm. I think the reason was, and I've said this before, is because, you know, they created the others. And I said this before the show even did this, and I got the receipts and everybody knows that. But yeah, (laughs) the children of the forest created the others to fight mankind. And the reason they didn't help is because they thought, maybe we can wait it out. Maybe it won't get so bad. And the reason they decided to help because it got too bad. And they knew that they had created something that they could not control anymore and they had to stop it. I think we talked about this. I think me and you talked about this. um, I'm sure we And Tony on -hmm. the the podcast episode that we did about the Children of the Forest having like different factions. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I I would always say that like, okay, so we, we, like a lot of people assume that the children, the children are not hive minded, right? So you have the pact. Let's say the children did make a pact to like, we will give mankind most of Westeros and we'll just take the deep woods. After 2000 years of the age of heroes and all of this prosperity of mankind where the children are like shriveling and becoming basically nothing. Mm -hmm. I think that the ancestors of those children of the forest probably had a different idea 
you know, they thought maybe our ancestors got screwed because if you remember, it's only in the show that the children live thousands of years. In the right. book, it's a few hundred years. So the initial children that signed that pact would have been different from the ones that created the White Walkers. Mm -hmm. So I think it was, I think it was thousands of years of those children watching the prosperity of mankind through the trees while they suffered and they died that pushed them to be like, you know what, maybe our ancestors were wrong, or maybe just a certain group of them, you know, said that's, our ancestors were wrong. That's and those were the I ones. Think. Yeah. Like, it, it's like there, there's like a radical faction somewhere in the children yeah, of the forest. That and makes like, they became the others. Right. Exactly. <laughs> that makes that's that's what I I mean, I think we talked about it and I was like, and you convinced me, and I'm like, yes, bitch, that's it. <laughs> because, There's a radical faction out there, and they created the others, and like the uh, because when you think of the children of the forest, they're like you said, they're not hive minded. They're not. They don't all think the same. They mm -hmm. there's I'm sure there's different tribes, mm -hmm. just like with any race. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for and, George R. R. Martin wouldn't make a homogenous race of children of the forest. He just right. wouldn't be. That's not what he does. <laughs> That's not how he writes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like, like it, 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 it would have been a faction of them that got tired of being weak and got tired of being bullied by humanity and decided to take back what was rightfully theirs. Because if you look at what the others are doing, they're just reclaiming their land if they are the children of the forest. Right. Because we, we, we learn in, in the world of ice and fire and just through the lore that the reason that the children lost mainly was because they were small and didn't have good armor. Their magic wasn't enough. And what do the others have, right? Armor that's better than any armor that any men have. Weapons that are better than any weapons that any men have. That's what they needed. And the biggest thing that is that they, the weapon of, of the White Walker turns men's numbers against them absolutely their absolutely. dead becomes an army for the white walkers you're so right and the key is we learn and dance that the children had always had small numbers they were they always outnumbered mm -hmm. you're so right you're so that's such a good point like that, that those are the key things it made them stronger it gave them better weapons and it gave them it gave them the numbers so yeah <laughs> yeah i mean when i when i um think about the white walkers there's this quote in a world of ice and fire and it's like it talks about the children sacrificing their own young yes and i'm like how desperate could they have been to actually create them that where their numbers were already so small that they would sacrifice a thousand of their own young but the the tale's conflicting because there's like it was either a thousand of their own young or a, a thousand. thousand captives. Yeah, yeah. So that was to break the arm of Dorn. So I, if the magic was intense enough, I don't know if it was a thousand. Mm -hmm. I can see it being like a few of their own young, maybe. Right. Because we know how powerful blood magic is. And look, I just want to say this. It's not really a sacrifice if you're sacrificing men, is it? Right. That you don't um, like anyway. Mm -hmm. And see, I think that the White Walkers were initially created. Like, I don't buy that dragon glass going into the heart shit. That's, That's bullshit. I think they were created when they broke the Arm of Dorne. Because, because it's a passage in there and it says, the ground shook and giants awoke in the earth. And I'm like, okay, well, giants were already around. So what are they talking about? Are they talking about like giants as in gods, like in Norse myth? You know, they do like, gods and giants mm -hmm. so i'm like are they talking about that because that would mean maybe white walkers maybe the white walkers because if you think about them breaking the arm of dawn what really did it do like the people were already there the the song was too late the battle was already lost yeah it doesn't make any sense like they're already there yeah exactly you're so right about that and then also the horn of winter is said to wake giants from stone and everybody's got a bunch of ideas about that. Maybe it means an earthquake. But it's like, why is it called the Horn of Winter? You know what I mean? Right. And I was thinking that maybe the giants awakening in the earth could have been a metaphor for an earthquake. The White too. Walker. It could have, or maybe it could have been a metaphor for the White Walkers. Yeah. Maybe the Horn of Winter not only brings down the wall, but it like 
I don't know, the great other wakes up or something. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's so- called the horn of winter. <laughs> like, why do you, why do we, why are we so sure that it's going to just, dis- I don't know. That is- it's, it's so crazy. But in this passage, in this passage, um, she says, old Nan says that um, they came for the first time. In mm-hmm. the, at this time with the last hero legend and all this stuff, so I'm like, when did they actually come? <laughs> when when did they actually come? Because the histories are so inaccurate. Like they, these are oral histories that have been written down yeah. years later. Mm-hmm. Well, there's no doubt that the timeline is all fucked around. Oh my Anybody god. Anybody that's like <laughs> we, the timeline is accurate, no, it's all fucked around. You know? we oh did yeah, a we've whole been through this. Podcast <laughs> we've been through this. <laughs> yes, so we did. I'll actually I'll link that cuz that was really it was like a really good discussion. It's tense though, guys. So it, it is tense. <laughs> <laughs> so, the last hero part of the story that old Nan tells um is very interesting and I I don't know who initially came up with this theory, but I've heard it a lot. But they were comparing Bran to the last hero and like the companions that the last hero has. Mm -hmm. And I had went further like and elaborated on that because like the horse, the dog, like I feel like Hodor is the horse. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. (laughs) And then there's the dog, um, which would be Summer. Summer. And then the companions. He doesn't have 12 companions, though. Not yet. But maybe at some point, I don't know. (laughs) Maybe at some, like, cold hands. um, Maybe he'll have a squad at some point. We don't know. (laughs) Count them all up. I don't think George, I don't think George is going to kill all the children like they did in the show, so. Oh, my God. That was so, like, that That was was annoying. (laughs) We don't don't even need to discuss it. The children and Summer, like, just in one episode. It was, that was, no. What are are you doing? Right. So I actually like want to talk about this one part that the others hated iron. Oh yeah. So what interests me about that is the crypts of Winterfell and the stark ritual of p- placing an iron sword to over contain the, the dead. spirits. Yeah, to contain the spirits. Like I feel like there's a connection with the White Walkers and that ceremonial practice. There absolutely is. I went great. Like, I think you intuitively picked up on that because I, I, I do. I, I totally agree with you because it's like <laughs> all of the freaking Stark traditions are like based in shit that they had to do to survive. All of those mm-hmm. northern traditions like they they live fucking hard lives because like shit gets fucking hard and they don't do shit unless there's purpose to it, even if they fucking forgot it, because like men forget shit. Right. Like, so absolutely. If, if old man is saying here that the fucking, that the White Walkers hated the touch of iron. And then we also get that piece of information that they used iron swords to contain the spirits. That is absolutely what is happening. Maybe the iron swords prevented the White Walkers from waking them up, you know? Mm -hmm. And then what does that say about the iron swords that Bran and Mira and them took? That have rusted away and the ones that have rusted away. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe those spirits are gonna get wake up. Oh yeah, gonna get woken. I want to see what happens. And, because Ned, if, and Ned's terrified of that. If you had a, and, and there's dreams about that stuff happening. Mm-hmm. Like if, if you had a history with dead people waking up and you knew iron could stop it, you absolutely would put an iron sword on those motherfuckers. Oh, for sure. And like, even when they talk about Brandon Stark building Winterfell, mm-hmm. it says he built it after the long night to withstand. I forget the exact quote, but you can tell he built it where he built it to withstand if they ever came back Mm -hmm. if they ever came back and the um i definitely think like the crypts of winterfell was built on like an old children of the forest hollow hill because it's that makes sense it's not leveled it's it's uh definitely like it's where bran woke up like opened his third eye um the 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 hot springs and the black pool. And we know that there's a black river at the other cave. In the Sunless north. sea. Yeah. So Look, <laughs> we don't even know how far the Winterfell crypts go. And yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think it's connected. And look, here's the thing, Gray. 
since we since we talked about Hodor a little bit and Mira and Brandon that cave and dance, Mira knows how to make boats, right? Does she not? Like she yeah. she's she's a frog girl, so it's like they were already talking about the sunless sea. They say that it's hard for like a ch- the children to navigate down there because they can't really see that well because it's really dark. But men can't do it at all. If Bran and Mira, if they if that cave got attacked by the White Walkers, they would have no chance of running away outside. Period. No chance. Yeah. Like how would they get away? Just think about that. They wouldn't oh, be able think, to get away. Do you think Mira is gonna like? boat down the river like take them boat out down the river <laughs> i and would love with it a, with one of the children as their guide oh and i then, would love it what could, it would be even creepier if like let's say the others followed them down and then they had to like evade them inside of the darkness because then it would be like gendo's children you know oh. those stories of gendo's children like we have to see some scary cave stuff yes. i mean what the show did didn't make sense to a degree that just doesn't make sense it just doesn't make sense. But if they did it that way, if we go down and we use darkness as our shield, just like Blood Raven says, then, mm-hmm. then maybe we can do it. So what do you think about the spiders, the ice spiders, pale white spiders as big as hounds? Do you think we'll see ice spiders in winds? Yes. Yeah. I think, I think, I think ice spiders are happening. I've all, I, ice spiders need to happen. It's one thing they didn't do in the show for some reason. I don't know. I guess budget or whatever. But eye spiders, yeah. Because look, the White Walkers themselves are beings that are just like ice personified, essentially. So why wouldn't they? And they've got ice swords and ice armor. And they can do stuff with ice that no one even knows. And if they are the children of the forest, that means they've got that like the skin changing ability. Um, so yeah, why, why not ice spiders? Right. I would love to see ice spiders. But I don't want to stay here too long, even though I feel like this is the most interesting part of the chapter. I do want to talk about Tyrion coming Mm -hmm. to Winterfell. Um, Tyrion coming to Winterfell. So one thing that... So Tyrion is left Castle Black and Mm -hmm. Theon asked him to help Bran. So he goes to Winterfell. Theon comes up and gets Bran um, to come come down to, to see Tyrion. So one thing that really interests me is the direwolves interactions with Tyrion. And I always wondered, is it that they don't like Tyrion or is it that they are their master's creatures and they're feeling their master's emotions? I I think it's the second thing you said. I think the direwolves, they're connected to the Starks. So if the Starks are like, I don't trust this imp, the wolves aren't going to trust him. I think that's what it is. Yeah, and it's it's different with someone like Melisandre, who can like touch ghosts and use and do some magic. She probably has some perfume on her hands that made the wolf like her or something. I don't know, but like <laughs> when it comes to Tyrion, yeah, yeah, it's definitely that. Yeah, um, so Tyrion comes in. Um, Rob is like Rob yeah. is not having it with Tyrion. He's being the super douche. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Rob has a has his sword out right? Mm-hmm. He has a sword out. Um, he's not offering any hospitality to a Tyrion Lannister. Um, but Tyrion comes, um, he finds out that Bran doesn't remember what happened to him and he has drawn up uh, the plans for the, for, saddle. for the saddle. And this has always interested me, the actual saddle, because there's a lot of theories that Bran might ride a dragon with said saddle. <laughs> How do you feel about those theories? That would be, I don't know if I'm going to see Bran riding a dragon, warding a dragon, skin chaining a dragon. That might happen. But riding one, I don't think so. Because he's not a Targaryen. That's not his art. He's yeah. not going to ride a dragon. I don't and think then he's like, going to ride a dragon either. But what I love about this scene, cripples, bastards, and broken things. Mm-hmm. It's Tyrion. Like, yes, John asked him to do this, but like Tyrion is really doing this because he honestly does feel bad for Bran. Yeah. And he knows that Bran is crippled because of his family. He knows that. Even if he doesn't like directly know it, he knows it. He knows it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I think he felt bad. And honestly, he felt some connection with Bran in the same way that he felt that connection with John, like as an outsider, as someone that's 
will we'll now from this point on experience the world in a totally different place. Like we'll always kind of be less in certain people's eyes. Yes. I think that was the connection that Tyrion made with Bran. And that's why he felt the need to like really, really, really create him a saddle that could work and c- could give him like that little bit of happiness at least. Yeah. And I also think like that this is a setup for later. I do think that um, Tyrion and Bran will have some kind of interaction later, just like John and mm-hmm. John and Tyrion will likely have some interaction later. And I feel like it's starting a good base foundation for the cripples, ba- cripples, bastards and broken things arc. Mm-hmm. I feel like this, this is a good foundation. Like Tyrion has done Bran a kindness. So he has no, reason to have like ill will towards him in the future and and then brand can see everything so mm-hmm. and that, that have a reason to yeah that tells you about Tyrion and how different he is from like you no know, cersei and even jamie in the beginning because yeah. jamie jamie only cares about brienne when he starts to like her you know and i mean not saying that jamie is like fully awful he's kind of hardened by the world because he did save king's land he did do that and he's been hardened and kind of grown bitter whereas Tyrion. At this point, I think has a little bit of optimism and at least wants to like help where we know he moves into a much darker place. But I think what this scene is showing us, though, is like Tyrion's true nature at his core. This is who he is. Yeah. Like Tyrion is such a likable character. He's such a likable person. And I talked about in Tyrion 1 and 2 um, how I feel like George went the extra mile to make him likable mm-hmm. and then it he has such a drastic turn in dance mm-hmm. i feel like he he's he's getting a lot darker than oh, what yeah. than what he is but at his core Tyrion is a good person he is and that's that's the thing that remains true except when he rides the dragon and burns down king's landing and wins which is definitely gonna happen <laughs> oh shit. no i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> Let's say, oh god. Uh, let's not get angry again. Yeah, Both of us are Danny fans, so it's yeah, like, like le- the last podcast episode I did is two hours and twenty minutes because we went on a rant about season eight. Mm, they tried it. Uh, they, they tried, tried it. it. They really did. Um, <laughs> the only thing that Bran can really think about in this moment is old Nan's story of the White Walkers and the last hero. And the White Woods and the Dead Man and the Spider, Spider's Biggest Hounds. Like, he says in this chapter, he was afraid for a moment until he remembered how the story ended. The children will help him, he blurted. The children of the forest. So he's thinking about Benjen. So he's found out that Benjen got lost mm-hmm. north of the wall. And he's like, the children are going to help him. And I swear, I feel like that's like cold hands foreshadowing. But then George says that Benjamin isn't cold hands. cold hands. Like, what is going <laughs> on, George? Tell us, give, give, we need this book, man. What's happening? No, I need, yeah, we need to know. Like, I don't know what is going on. Yeah. Like, was that a mistake? Because it seems like all the foreshadowing is like cold hands is Benjamin, But it does also kind of seem too obvious. And then they also said he died long ago. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know. I would and think then he was, says to, I would think it was like a lot of years considering yeah. the children lived so many years for them to say yeah. long ago. Like long they didn't ago. say like last month, last year, <laughs> long ago. <laughs> it's one of those things that's supposed to make you think like, what the heck? It's like when Melisandre says, I've studied my art for years beyond count. And then she's like 25 or something. It's like, no, that's not, you, mu- you have to be much older than that. So like, and then, you know, Coldhand says that weird thing to Bran too when Bran is like, Bran is not, Bran doesn't even say it out loud, I don't believe. He's, he thinks to himself, like, who is this? Who is he? And then Cold Hands looks at him and says, I'm your monster, Brandon Stark. Mm-hmm. Like, so like, it's like, what's what? that about? Like, <laughs> what are you, what the heck? What is that supposed to, what, what are you talking about? Does that mean, <laughs> is that, is, what, are you, what are you saying? I create, you created me? Yeah, like Bran created him. Like, What? That is such a weird thing. And that's why everybody thinks time travel, like, that's why it's not, like, really crazy. It's not on. crazy. Like, and also, traveling without moving, that's, that's a phrase in Doom, basically. That Bran could do that. He doesn't have to physically time travel. If he can project his mind into the past and just 
influence, subtle shit, show up in the right time, Mm -hmm. in the right moment to the right person. That's all you need to change stuff. So like the fact that Ned heard his voice, exactly. (laughs) The fact that Ned heard his voice says it all. Yeah. And um, I also think like this is the beginning, like that little, the children of the forest, the children will help him. I also think that this is the beginning of like Bran's ideas about the children of the forest, even though he's, he has the, the whole coma dream, but he's actually saying the children of the forest and Yorin actually puts it in his head. Like, um, Maester Lewin's like, oh, you know, like the children are all dead and gone for thousands of years. All that is left of them are the faces in the trees. And Yorin's like down here might be that's true. Uh, yeah. but up past the wall, who's to say up there? A man can't always tell what's alive and what's dead. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's the thing. The I think it's I think George is making a statement about like people that live in a place know the place. It's like if 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 you if it's like na- like a native tribe that's like always lived in like a certain part of the land or something. You can't just go in there and tell those people what's up. They know the seasons. They know the animals. They know how it works. Right? They're, they're, these people are intricately connected with the land. You know what I'm saying? And the same is true for the wildlings and even the Black Brothers that visit to the north yes. and see it. You go yeah. there and you, you get familiar with it and you know what's there. And then also on top of that, it's like George R. Martin likes to talk about like magical auras and stuff like that. He talks about it with the wall and he talks about it with the five forts. I'm sure the others have some kind of aura. I'm sure like magic has an aura. I'm sure magic has a feeling. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Something mm-hmm. that you can detect when it's there. It's like the hairs that stand up on the back of your neck. Yeah. Except intensified. So yeah. Yeah. Um, the last thing I guess I want to touch on before we wrap this up is mm-hmm. Rob and Brand's relationship. I feel like this chapter does a lot for Rob. Like it makes you really like Rob. Even in like when he's like in the Catelyn chapter when he's kind of like, you know, mom, like, I need you too. Like, I'm like 15, mom. Like, uh, yes. I'm a little boy still. <laughs> but he promises, like, he tucks Bran in and, like, he blows the candle out and he promises, like, I'm going to get you a horse. We're going to ride the horse. You're, we're going to uh, go to the wall. Uh, George Martin is a monster. I can't believe he killed Rob. <laughs> Yes, I know. And Bran's like, I could see my brother smiling in the dark. Like, he could hear his smile. And it's just so oh, sweet. That is and very touching. sweet. Mm-hmm. And it's like, um, what did, what, how does it close up? And Bran's like, an adventure, Bran repeated wistfully. He heard his brother sob. The room was so dark, he could not see the tears on Rob's face. So he reached out and found his hands, their fingers twined together. And it's like just this so sweet and touching sweet. scene and just a sweet way to end it. And like Rob, I feel like he always gets like this bad rap of like being just an idiot and like hot headed, yeah. kind of like he Brandon. made some dumb decisions, but you know, but he he's a, a good... he's a kid. Yeah, he's 15. He cares about his family. He deeply. does. Deeply. And everything he did was for his family. And he was thrust into a position that like no 15 year old ever should have to do. He's going to war for his whole family because they took his dad captive and then yeah. killed his dad. Like, what is he supposed to do? The saddest fucking part about Rob's story is that he promises to marry Walter Frey's daughter to cross that bridge. And then when he gets to the other side, his dad, like he's doing it to save his dad. Mm-hmm. And then when he gets to the other side, his dad's his dad is gone. dead. Yeah. Like that's so fucking sad and bitter and hard. And then that decision kills him. And that decision kills him. But he was doing it for his dad. Ugh, it's hard. It's hard. This is a good chapter. It is a great chapter. There's I'm a lot of this chapter. So fucking glad you came on. <laughs> anytime. Like literally anytime, Ray. You know. This this podcast began with Gray and Quinn and like we're always gonna be I'm always gonna be jumping in this as long as it goes on. <laughs> Honey, Quinn is a celebrity out here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> published published author. You guys can definitely check out Tadia though. Yes. Mm-hmm. Tadia. Yes, like check out Tadia. Order Tadia. I'll be reviewing Tadia when I get my copy. I order my copy. You know, I gotta support my friends. Um, but yes. 
check Quinn out. I'm like, I'm sure you guys already know him, but if you don't, he's got all the Dune juice for you. Um, and, and I've been, I've been doing a bunch of Lovecraft stuff recently too. Oh yes, <laughs> Halloween's oh. gonna be good. It's, it's getting creepy this Halloween. Oh, I'm for it. <laughs> I'm for the old ones. Yes. So that was yeah. brand four, and I will see you guys next week. Bye, Bye guys. It's been so much fun. <laughs>